So welcome everyone. Uh, as Jen introduced, I'm so thrilled to be here with you today to present the Alzheimer's Society of BC's uh, webinar called Understanding Dementia, What is Dementia? Now I'm just going to, there we go, sorry, just manipulating my screen a little bit here. Um, this webinar was developed for healthcare providers from all sorts of different uh, workplaces, whether in home care or long-term care, for people who are supporting people living with dementia. And I understand uh, from Jen, she mentioned uh, some of the registrants here today, are not just care staff, but non-care staff too. So welcome to all the people who are our housekeepers working in our food services and administration roles. Really excited to have you a part of this as well. And I'd also like to say thank you to Safe Care BC for organizing this webinar. The Alzheimer's Society of BC has a partnership with Safe Care BC. Typically in non-COVID times, we'd be offering an in-person workshop called Creating Connections, working with people with dementia. But today, of course, we're, we're coming to you through this webinar platform. Okay, so my name is Mariana Hudson and I'm the Provincial Coordinator for Healthcare Provider Education at the Alzheimer's Society of BC. I work within our Advocacy and Education Department. Now, if you don't know very much about the Alzheimer's Society, it, just to let you know, it is a nonprofit organization that is province-wide. And our vision is a world without Alzheimer's disease and other dementias. And that world begins with a more dementia-friendly society, one that, where people who are affected by dementia feel supported, acknowledged, and included. In my role, I spend the majority of my time supporting healthcare providers through education sessions like these to just ensure that people feel that they have the skills, the confidence, and the knowledge that they, that they need to provide person-centered care to people who are living with dementia. And yeah, that's, that's my little intro. So I'll get right into what we're going to be learning about today. So here are learning objectives. Uh, today we'll be focusing on the difference between Alzheimer's disease and dementia and we'll also be kind of taking a look at what normal aging looks like as well in that norm in that context. We'll, we'll take a look at what to expect, what are some signs of dementia, what causes dementia, and what does a typical progression look like. And one of the key things I'll just point out is that we, we do talk about typical progressions, but one of the key takeaways from today is that everyone's journey with dementia is unique. Everyone has different factors that affect how their dementia does progress. So I just want to point that out, but we'll look at a typical progression. And I'll kind of um, end the, the webinar with um, just some, some resources for healthcare providers from the Alzheimer's Society of BC. So I'll be spending about 30 minutes covering this content and I'll leave about 10 to 15 minutes at the end to go over these resources as well as answer any questions or concerns that come up during our, our time together. Okay, so when we when we put out this, the um, description or the ad, the registration process for this webinar today, we um, provided some recommended reading. Now, if you had the chance to read the part one, Understanding Dementia in the pre-reading materials, you would have discovered the following items about what is dementia. Oh, sorry, it's not clicking ahead, there we go. Um, We'll start off with a very general description of what dementia is. Dementia is a medical term that is used to describe a variety of symptoms, and symptoms can be just understood as signs. And these are some of the most common ones. Most people associate dementia with memory loss, and that is definitely one of the signs, but there's some other symptoms as well. Difficulty thinking. For someone living with dementia, um, difficulty thinking could be like having difficulty with um, problem solving, simple or even more complex problem solving, that could be a sign of dementia. There could also be communication difficulties and that can show up in so many different ways. And, and one example of that is maybe difficulty understanding gestures, body language, or even words that come from others. So trying to really understand what, what others are saying to you or even outgoing information, your words and your expressions as well can, can be a, a sign of that. And finally, behavior changes. A person living with dementia may experience changes in mood or behavior. Another key note to make, another uh, key point about dementia is that it is caused by progressive degenerative diseases in the brain. And that simply means that these symptoms that I've just listed will get worse over time as more brain cells become damaged and eventually die. And finally, 
the last most important part is that dementia is not actually a normal part of aging. Um, it's actually a myth that we commonly hear as, you know, as you get older, of course, we all lose our memory. That's a common way that we think about age, but it's actually not true in that, in that sense. As we get older, changes in our memory are normal, and actually about 40% of people over the age of 65 experience some form of memory loss or, or changes in their memory. But when there is no underlying medical condition, something like dementia, that causes that memory loss, it is known as age-associated memory impairment, which is considered a normal part of aging. However, the types of symptoms that people who are living with Alzheimer's disease or other types of dementias experience are actually quite different. And now we're gonna take a look at some of them. So in this slide, I'm going to just review some of the signs of dementia. And I'll kind of make some comments about what, what, why is that different or how is it different from normal aging? But before I begin, one thing I wanna point out that is important to emphasize the, is the, the, the idea of change. So if a person has always had poor memory or maybe difficulty finding words because they perhaps speak multiple languages and that's, that, can, that can commonly happen, then having poor memory or having difficulty finding words in that same, in that same way, maybe at the age of 75, might not be something that is as extremely alarming or concerning as someone who might have just developed it. So I wanna just make that point of change is really important and your roles when you support people living with dementia and get to know them over time and get to know families and their stories about them really helps you be in that position to understand whether one of these signs is new or something that they've always had. So I just wanted to emphasize that before I begin. Okay, so let's start with the first one. And this is one of the symptoms I just listed, which is problems with memory. So for, for people that don't have dementia, that have any, um, for, for normal aging, it is normal to, to occasionally forget appointments, forget your neighbor's name or somebody you met a year ago, a friend's phone number, and, re and sometimes recall them later on. That, that's a normal, that's normal experience for, for most people. Now, a person who's living with dementia, however, may forget things more often and not remember them later on, especially things that have happened more recently. And you hear changes in short-term memory as an example of that. So it's memory loss that's really affecting that day-to-day -day function is critical here. Another sign of dementia is you might start seeing people having difficulty with familiar tasks. Now, busy people can be distracted from time to time and that's, and you know, forget something and come back to it later. For example, a person cooking a meal at home, boiling the carrots, if that's what they do or however they prepare it, and not remembering to serve them until maybe at the end of the meal, but they've remembered that they've put something together and done all the steps to prepare that task. A person who's living with dementia may actually have trouble with those tasks, all the steps of the way, all the sequences that are involved. And maybe they've been familiar, especially things that they've been familiar with all their lives, such as preparing a meal or even getting dressed, all the elements that are that um, all the sequence of events that take for someone to get dressed, finding their clothes, laying it out, matching all of those pieces. That might be something that you might start to see in someone that you're supporting. The inability to find the right words, so problems with language. Um, everyone, well, many people have trouble finding words from time to time, and that's kind of expected. But as a per with a person living with dementia, the person may actually forget simple words or substitute words, often leading to sentences that are difficult to understand. Again, this is, um, this is important to recognize that, that concept of change. If this is a way that the person's always spoken versus something that they're starting to do more recently, those are signs that are worth uh, making note of. Problems with abstract thinking is also a sign of dementia. And what I mean by that are, are things like making sense of symbols or images, things that like bathroom symbols, for example, the bathroom sign is a symbol. And that, depending on what the symbol looks like, they can be quite abstract and actually not make sense to somebody. So somebody looking for the washroom may not actually see the symbol of the washroom because they're trying to make sense of what that means and they're looking somewhere else. Um, another abstract thought is or figure of speech using metaphors, uh, such as a place to hang your hat or I'm so hungry I could eat a horse kind of thing. Those, those kinds of uh, comments might not make sense to somebody who's having difficulty with that processing those abstract ideas. Um, 
challenges following conversations. So this is another sign. So um, it's pretty normal from time to time if you're in a conversation that you can kind of lose train of thought if you're not actively listening to other people and you might lose your place in the conversation. And that's that can be considered normal. But for a person who's living with dementia, they may be a step behind in the conversation or might reply in an inappropriate way that doesn't actually match what is being discussed or talked about. Completely different topic, for example. That could be a sign. Uh, poor judgment. An example of that is, for example, um, you know, looking at, I'm just looking outside my window right now, I see some clouds, I'm going to probably put on a sweater or a jacket to go outside. But somebody who is experiencing a lapse in poor judgment might see that and think, oh, it's really hot. And, uh, and knowing what season we're in, all those pieces, of course, factor into a decision, might just wear a t-shirt and shorts and be very cold outside. A very simple example, but just to show changes in, in making decisions and, and judging uh, situations. And finally, disorientation of time or place is quite common for, uh, it's a quite common sign of, of dementia as well. And to illustrate this, you know, it's, it can be normal to forget the, the day of the week sometimes, or your destination where you might be going for a moment. But a person who's living with dementia can become lost in familiar spaces. For example, the street that they've lived on their whole life or not knowing how they got somewhere or how to get home, for example. So really demonstrating signs of confusion. So this is just a very brief list, but some examples of some signs of dementia that you really good to know about, especially as you're supporting people. Um, at the very beginning of the slide, I mentioned that concept of change and how important it is to consider it if you're trying to determine whether or not a person's experience is a sign of dementia, which is something to definitely be concerned about. So ask yourself, is this normal for the person or is this something that's changing in them? Now, whether you work in home care, long-term care, hospital setting, no matter what, wherever you're working to support people living with dementia, you have the opportunity to get to know those people very well. You get to know their personality, their preferences, strengths, and abilities. And if you have a relationship with family members, you can learn a lot from them as well. And you're often in a very good position, actually probably one of the best positions, to recognize changes in the person. So for example, some of these communication or behavior changes. So taking the time to report these changes, or however the structure is in your organization, but if you have a colleague or a supervisor that you can report these changes to, it can be actually be very important in identifying an underlying condition or concern which can lead to an early diagnosis or treatment. So if you're a housekeeper and you go into a suite once a week, multiple times a week, however, whatever the schedule is, and you start seeing someone who normally has their, you know, wakes up really early, opens up their blinds, has the, all the light coming in and everything located in whatever spot needs to be. And then, you know, a week later you start seeing, oh, the blinds are not closed or the blinds are fully closed and the person's still in bed and, oh, everything's kind of been knocked around here. And that seems to be the a pattern happening there's something possibly that's going on. So really sharing that information and, and seeing how uh, the person can be supported to see if there's something going on. Okay, so I think we're done with our signs right now. Now we're gonna focus on uh, causes of dementia. So what causes and what does dementia actually look like? What, how does the progression look like? So this slide kind of um, shows a sequential um, order of events. And we're going to start by taking a look at the fact that progressive degenerative diseases, and we'll kind of take a look at this list here. So the causes of dementia are, for the most part, and I'll come back to that point later, are caused by a series of different types of diseases. And the most common and the one that we think about the most is Alzheimer's disease. And the, the reason for that is simply that it is the most common. About 60 to 80 percent of people who are living with dementia have Alzheimer's disease. And this one, Alzheimer's disease, and I'll be talking a little bit more about it today, just because it is the most common. I'll be using it in my examples. But it's, it's basically caused by an abnormal accumulation of protein inside and outside of our brain cells, causing, um, affecting the neurons and their ability to communicate with one another, eventually uh, ending up dying. So that's why the, the death of cells is important to remember there. The first thing that's mostly affected by uh, Alzheimer's disease, the, the first symptom, sorry, that you'll see is likely related to memory. And 
Alzheimer's disease typically, in general, has a slower progression than some of the other causes of dementia that I'll kind of allude to here. And it typically can be a slow progression. But again, it, it depends on the person and other perhaps illnesses and other factors that are contributing to their health. Somebody can live with it for up to eight to 10 years or longer or shorter. It You can't really find a middle ground there. But just to give you a sense that compared to some of the other causes of dementia, it is a slower progression. And that's, yeah, that was what I wanted to just mention about Alzheimer's disease. Now, the other one that I'll just mention right now, because not, we don't have the, the time today to really go into each of them, but just to compare it with vascular dementia, another common, probably next to Alzheimer's disease, um, you get mixed dementias, which is often vascular and Alzheimer's disease together. Um, vascular dementia is unlike Alzheimer's disease, where this accumulation of protein buildup in the brain, uh, vascular dementia is caused by blockages or ruptures in the vessels, so in the brain, so like a stroke. Um, it's caused by problems with blood flow, oxygen, and nourishment of brain cells. Someone with vascular dementia, unlike Alzheimer's disease, often has a sudden onset of symptoms. So you start seeing really uh, big changes right away. And the symptoms that we see depend on the type of the part of the brain that is actually affected. So I actually knew somebody who had been diagnosed with vascular dementia and her, uh, actually her memory overall was intact. What was, what was um, happening to her were changes in her mood and personality. So without knowing her whole medical history, I could have assumed that it uh, occurred in the part of the brain that controls a lot of our personality and mood and our decision making, which is the frontal lobe. So the changes in that person will will start seeing um, the parts of that brain, the frontal lobe that control a lot of the other uh, parts of decision making, personality, parts of our language. Might see we might be seeing changes there before we start seeing changes in other parts of the brain person with vascular dementia can also have really, really good days and bad days. There's a lot of fluctuation happening there, making it uh, quite not the most predictable type of dementia. So those are just two I'll focus on, but there's a whole list of other ones. And if you do want to learn more, I'll be sharing some resources anyway at the end of this webinar so you can continue that learning. But the key takeaway is that there are more than one cause of dementia of, and it's Alzheimer's disease is the most common. Now, if you have Alzheimer's disease or any of the other, oops, sorry, there we go. So what these progressive degenerative diseases do is they damage brain cells and the neural pathways, ultimately leading to the symptoms that we addressed or that I mentioned earlier, which is the memory loss, confusion and disorientation, the impaired judgment, communication problems or behavior changes. So that's, that's sort of the, the overview of what's happening in the brain and that these uh, diseases are causing these types of symptoms because of the, the brain damage that it's creating in the brain. Now we're gonna talk a little bit about progression. When we talk about a particular case of dementia, for example, Alzheimer's disease, we often discuss the progression of the disease in stages. And this is really just a general way of talking about what the disease looks like over time so that the person or healthcare workers or family, anybody that's supporting them can really kind of know what to expect. People, however, move through these stages at their own rate and symptoms can vary from, can be different from one person to the next, which is why time estimates are so difficult to predict. Um, okay, so we're gonna focus, uh, I'm gonna move on to the next slide. For the purposes of our discussion today, I will be providing you with the example of Alzheimer's disease. In this image on the slide that you're seeing, early, middle and, st and late, and you see the brains with the different coloring in all of them, what that represents is sort of the trajectory of Alzheimer's disease. So typically what we see is we start seeing changes in memory. So if you recall, I, I mentioned that earlier, and that's what that first early stage um, image with a little bit of the blue is representing. And that blue is in the area of our temporal lobe. So kind of by the ear, not quite in this image, but kind of by the ear is our temporal lobe. And one of the important things that the temporal lobe has is an area called the hippocampus, which is responsible for memory. So that's typically the area of the brain that is affected with Alzheimer's disease. And then it spreads to other parts of the brain. 
And so then you see kind of movement towards the frontal lobe here in that second image and then towards the late stage, it's all kind of uh, occurring in all parts of the brain. So the frontal lobe part of the brain, you'll see changes in decision making and personality, as I mentioned earlier, with the example of vascular dementia. So now I'm going to take that stages and kind of break it down a little bit more by giving some examples of what that actually translates to in terms of uh, the signs or symptoms that you might see the person actually experiencing or the changes in their abilities. Again, this example is just based on Alzheimer's disease. Um, somebody who is perhaps uh, has vascular dementia, different part of the brain has been affected or frontal temporal dementia might will be showing different signs in different order. I just wanna preface that by saying it, but we'll just focus on Alzheimer's disease today. So starting in the early stage, it's typically where you see mild symptoms occurring. <clears throat> Excuse me. Some, you'll start to see some initial forgetfulness, easily perhaps shifting in mood more than before. Person might to start might actually start withdrawing from social activities, and there could be lots of reasons for that. But I would say typically people who are in this stage recognize that they're losing these abilities and don't want to actually put themselves in situations where they can't keep up or where they they're finding that they're being forgetful and not being able to converse in those conversations. And also you might the person might be experiencing some mild coordination problems. That's referring to things like maybe a walking is kind of changing a little bit. Now, as the disease progresses to the middle stage, the person will start to see moderate changes. So that initial forgetfulness and that easy shifting in the mood that we are seeing in the early stage is now turning into difficulty recognizing familiar things and larger personality changes. Also, the person might actually find it more difficult to concentrate on conversations or activities and need assistance with daily tasks. So the really big changes really are kind of occurring in that moderate um, stage. And then towards the late stage, the severe changes reoccur. So remember that the image from just before where we see all parts of the brain are sort of affected. Now the entire brain is impacted and the person's abilities are severely impacted. So the person will start to lose the ability to remember or process information and possibly completely withdraw from activities or engaging with others. The ability to communicate will be impacted tremendously in this stage. So you might start seeing someone very much not using their verbal communication, their words, and relying more on nonverbal communication. So they might be focusing more on eye contact, groaning, yelling, touch, different ways of communicating that way. Some physical changes that can occur in this late stage include sleeping longer, difficulty eating, swallowing, or being able to perform self-care. Now, one key point to understand, again, this is just for Alzheimer's disease, but one key point to understand about all dementias is that dementia is a fatal progressive degenerative disease of the brain, where the brain cells do continue to die over time. It might just happen in a different order or a different way. And unfortunately, right now, there is no cure or treatments or perfect treatments that can stop and reverse dementia symptoms like the cognitive decline. And eventually the body will shut down from the lack of instructions from the brain. One thing I'll just mention is that there are some treatable conditions that can cause symptoms, some of these symptoms of dementia that we, we've been listing here, and such as sleep disorders or delirium. Delirium can be caused by an acute infection. And those are things where somebody can experience that and have some of these signs and symptoms show up, but it's not because of a dementia, it's because of something else. So I won't be going further into that. That's more of a teaser, but if you do wanna learn more, um, again, some of the resources I'll be sharing with you later do talk about those if you, if you wanna dive into that a bit more. Okay, so we'll have a, take a look at the image of the brain. We've been talking a lot in, in lists and things, and now we have a bit of a visual here. What you're seeing here is a comparison between a healthy brain on the left and one with advanced Alzheimer's disease on the right. This image demonstrates what the brain of someone with advanced, advanced Alzheimer's disease would look like. So that late stage that we've talked about where a lot of their activities, a lot of their abilities, the person's abilities to communicate and, and take care of themselves is, is, has been impacted. Of course, one of the big things you'll probably notice here is the difference in size, the shrinking happening, and some of the gaps that are occurring between the cells there. And th this is, 
while there are several different diseases that cause dementia, as we've, we've learned about, they eventually become quite similar in their symptoms and eventually lead to pronounced shrinking of the brain or atrophy. Just might look a little different in different spots, but typically the, the shrinking does occur in all the, all the dementias. Now, this image is not a very pleasant one to look at, and I'll recognize that. However, it is important that we understand and recognize that there is a disease that is happening in the person's brain that is causing their symptoms. Oftentimes, a person living with dementia can may look healthy and maybe even look normal, and I'll just put that in quotations on the outside, which makes it actually difficult for us to really understand and make sense of their symptoms. This image can help us work through, the, through that by reminding us that the person's brain is changing in size, weight, and volume. They are not in control of their symptoms, and the normal pathways of communication between brain cells have permanently changed. Something to keep in mind with that is that they're often not doing things on purpose. And because we don't see these brain changes, unlike a cast on a broken arm or a scar that's left after surgery, it actually makes it a little bit more difficult for people to realize that there's physical changes occurring. So really, we, we as caregivers, as family members, as healthcare, as healthcare workers, we're the ones that need to change, need to change our approach, need to change how we act and interact with the person. We can't really expect that person to, who is experiencing brain damage to be changing and adapting to our needs. And here's a, a little example to consider. So a resident who asks kitchen staff, kitchen staff when lunch will be served. Maybe this isn't happening right now. This is a pre-COVID example, but I think you'll get the idea. Um, the kitchen staff who get asked this question tell them, oh, lunch will be served at 1130. Five minutes later, that person returns and asks, when will lunch be served? They tell him 1130. Five minutes later, he returns again and asks, when will lunch be served? They tell him 1130. The man may have asked the same question 5, 10, 20 times in a span of a half hour, and it definitely feels like that for the staff member who's being asked every time. But for him, for that person, each time he asks is actually the first time he is asked. So just let that sit with you. Maybe you've recognized that situation happens to you uh, in the workplace. Okay, so we're going to just switch gears for the last uh, few minutes of our of the um, content portion of this webinar. I'm going to, we're actually going to um, set up some polls. We'll get your involvement now. You've heard me talk for a little bit. Now it's your turn just to, to chat with your colleagues if you're in a group or to answer on your own if you're um, connecting on your own computer. We have, um, we at the Soci Alzheimer's Society hear a lot of different, uh, we, we know a lot about get a lot of different questions that pop up and lots of there are lots of myths and misconceptions about Alzheimer's disease and other dementias so I'm just going to start with asking you three different questions here and we'll give you an opportunity I'll just uh, so I see that there's three there Jen they're all together so we'll just get everybody to uh, to think about them oh great people are already voting so what I'll do on the screen is just show the questions have a chat we'll give you a few just a couple maybe a minute or so to vote and ask the questions and I'll review the answers in, the, in just a moment. So I'll just read them out as you're voting. Um, the first question, or the first true or false is Alzheimer's disease and dementia are the same thing, true or false. The second question is Alzheimer's disease is not preventable. Is that true or false? And the third question is because someone in my family lives with dementia, I'm gonna get it. Is that true or false? I should probably say I'm gonna get it too, but Anyway, <laughs> too late to change the question. <laughs> so I will just, I, I see, oh, I can actually see how many people have voted. So 15 out of 28. I'll just give you another minute just to, to think about that, put in your answers. Okay, I, I think that's, that's good. Oh, perfect, thank you. And does, can everyone see those results or is that just me that can see them? It's just me? No, everyone should be able to oh, see that. Okay, great. <laughs> Thank you. Um, okay, so great. Thank you very much for participating in that. And I, what I'm going to do is just go through each of them and review them, and then I'll, I'll finish up with some more slides. Okay, first question. Alzheimer's disease and dementia are the same thing. True or false? So we got the majority of you says false, and 25% are saying true. And the answer for this one is it is false. And I can see, I can see why the true people, I can see why 
they, these these two terms are really well connected, and that's why that's why this is actually one of the the most common questions that we get at the society is, well, they're the same thing, aren't they? So if we go back to thinking um, about one of the slides I went through earlier as Alzheimer's disease is a cause of dementia, that's kind of where this, this question comes from. So they are not technically the same thing. Alzheimer's disease is a type of dementia and not all people living with dementia are living with Alzheimer's disease. So that's one way to think about it. Um, dementia is caused by progressive and degenerative degenerative diseases in the brain. And Alzheimer's disease is one cause of dementia, the most common cause. So again, 60 to 80% of people living with dementia have are living with Alzheimer's disease. And other types include the vascular dementia we reviewed, but also frontal temporal dementia, Lewy body dementia, there's a whole host of other ones. So that's, that's where the connection is. They're not the same thing. One causes the other. Okay, the next question, Alzheimer's disease is not preventable. So this one's a little bit more shared here. We got 65% say true and 35% uh, voted false. So the answer for this one is actually true. It is not preventable. And however, we can do things to reduce our risk. When we talk, we talk about risk reduction at the Alzheimer's Society. So there is no guarantee, however, it's simply really the best we can do. So, so far, the most robust evidence that we have on risk reduction is attributed to physical exercise. The higher physical exercise has been associated with reducing risk of cognitive impairment, Alzheimer's disease, or other dementias. Another thing to think about is that Alzheimer's disease isn't the only cause of dementia. Strokes and cardiovascular diseases are implicated in about 50% of dementias, and their risk can be reduced by maintaining physical activity, which we just mentioned, but also having good nutrition, controlling blood pressure, and being socially active. Um, symptoms of dementia caused by drug interactions, vitamin deficiencies, or severe depression can also be reversed. Those are other things that you can do. But the actual um, answer for this one is no, it is not a preventable disease at this time, hopefully sometime in the future. And the last question, this one was very clear, 100% of you said false. So because someone in my family lives with dementia, I'm going to get it. And I added two at the end there. Um, and yes, the, the answer to this one's actually kind of a, a bit of a tricky one. So it's false brackets most of the time. So all of you, all of you got that answer right. Um, when I say false in most cases, what I mean by that is that genetics, while genetics do play a role in the development of some forms of dementia, the majority of cases do not actually have a strong genetic link. So it's actually a very small, small, small percentage of people that um, do have a genetic link. So most people uh, living with the most common type of dementia, Alzheimer's disease, did not get it from a family member. There is a type of Alzheimer's disease called familial Alzheimer's disease where Alzheimer's is inherited, but this counts for less than 5% of all cases. So that's why the answer is false for most, most cases and most, um, but yeah, very, very small percentage. Great, thank you very much. You can, I think I can, oh, stop sharing poll. Perfect, okay, so I, I realize I'm, I'm at the end here, so I'll just continue. Can I, I can just close out? There we go, <laughs> okay. Thank you. Okay, so I will just wrap up this section by just um, reviewing a couple more myths. So the, the first section here are the ones that we just reviewed, so I won't, I won't focus on that, but just want to remind everyone about um, when, when somebody gets a diagnosis of dementia, oftentimes um, now, this is, of course, not from experience, but people um, we've met through our work is that getting that diagnosis means, oh, you know, you're just ending up in long term care right away, that you get ignored as a person. And that that's something we want to to we really want to change that stigma around what dementia getting a diagnosis means. So one of the, the things well thought out, one of the most common are people living with dementia will no longer have a meaningful life. And Really, in reality, many people with lived experience continue to live meaningfully and continue to do things that give them pleasure and make them happy and be a part of their community. Creating meaningful and dementia-friendly communities, which is something that the Alzheimer's Society uh, works with or works on, can enable them to live to their fullest for as long as possible. And another, another piece, another myth that I want to talk about is the second one, that people living with dementia 
become aggressive. That's that's a common, again, a common um, misconception, misunderstanding about what dementia is and how it can impact a person. So doesn't mean that it doesn't happen. I don't want to say that, but I just want to say that it doesn't happen to everybody. So dementia affects each person differently, and certainly not everyone does become aggressive. The loss of memory and an increase in inability to understand what might be happening in their environment can cause people living with dementia to express their frustration through changes in their behavior. So um, taking steps to make the environment as comfortable as possible and calming can avoid many upsetting situations for the person living with dementia and people nearby. Now, we're not talking about behaviors today. There's actually a great well webinar that I delivered to safe care members in December that if you want to learn a little bit more about how the environment and other factors actually can impact a person's behavior, I do recommend that you take a look at that. And we have some links to share with you for that. But just to, to keep in mind that often a person's expression of their behavior can be attributed to things that are going on around them or physical changes that are occurring in them. I've experiencing pain or, or an infection, for example, can actually bring out those, those ways of communicating that something's not right. So just keep, uh, we need to just reframe how we talk about and how we think about um, people living with dementia becoming aggressive. And finally, the final thing I'll just mention there is that changes to the brain make it challenging for the person living with dementia to respond appropriately. And at times, uh, this can feel like an aggressive or an aggression towards uh, the care worker or someone else. Okay, so I'm, I know that I'm just wanting to get to time here. So I'll just briefly mention um, some of our resources and then I'll open up for questions. So just wanted to mention we have we have a website, no surprise there. So I welcome you to come and visit our website. We have lots of information on there for you to continue your learning. And I've just put up a couple of the links there. We have resources for COVID-19 that are specific for, for example, if you're trying to figure out ways to communicate uh, with your PPE on those, those kinds of challenges you might be experiencing, you can find some information there. And there's other resources as well. And we also have social media, so follow us and stay connected and learn what we're doing. Um, the the link that we sent to you before this pres this webinar started was a link to that part one of this booklet. So this booklet's called "A Building a Strong Foundation for Dementia Care." We offer different education through the society, and this is a participant booklet that we make available to everyone to learn a little bit more about the topics that we explore in these webinars. So feel free to we'll be sharing that link with you so you can learn a bit more about some of the topics we discussed today. And and other things as well, about communication or behavior, for example. So I'll share that with you at the end. And last but not least, I'll just mention our dementia helpline. So on this slide here is how you can contact us. And there's my contact information at the bottom there. If you need to, if you'd like to reach out to me and send me an email, that's the dementia education at alzheimerbc.org. But I want to highlight the first link to help dementia helpline. This is an excellent resource for people who are living with dementia, for family members that you're working with or that you know, perhaps a, you have a you have a personal connection to dementia. A great resource for them to access, but it's also there for you as staff in care or non-care roles to talk to somebody about a situation you're experiencing at work to problem solve that kind of thing so I just want to mention that that is available to you okay and that brings me and I'm sorry I'm not keeping to my 10 minute goal but question time so now is your opportunity to ask any questions or any clarifications that I can make for any of the content that we that I've gone over with you today. So we'll start with if you have any questions about um, the content. And I'll, I'll ask Jen to support me with this because I have too many screens to look at. So she's been watching the chat box. Yeah, we have Anything no come questions up? yet. No, That's nothing okay. Yet. But That's I did okay. want to say that Mariana will be doing another webinar with us on mm -hmm. September 14th and it is working with families. Mm -hmm. So if you would like to register for that one, it is available on the learning space. It's the same place that you registered for this webinar. Perfect. It looks like we have our first question. And it said, I've heard that learning new things can help prevent dementia. How true is that? Oh, learning can prevent dementia. That's a great question. And I think uh, I actually went recently to a an education session, and that that is consistently one of the things that we do here: learning new things and like um, using cognitive uh, resources online, like getting an app to learn new things. Um, what I what I understand is that there isn't robust 
evidence on that, that learning new things will prevent you from getting Alzheimer's disease or another dementia. I don't believe there is um, strong evidence to suggest that. However, just like with, well, physical, physical activity, as I mentioned earlier, does have um, ro relatively robust evidence to demonstrate that. But there's other things like learning new things. So whether that's um, learning, picking up a new language or staying social, being connected to other people, there is um, weaker evidence, but that, I think that's what most people suggest to do. Those are excellent activities and things that you should be doing just to keep your mind active and, and exercising those things. So yeah, I, I would say, so short answer, I don't believe that there is strong evidence to show that, but it does help. It does help in, in a lot of situations, just like the, the other, the staying socially connected and, and, uh, yeah, those were, that's what I was going to go to. Sorry. <laughs> Another question along the same lines is, are there any techniques or strategies to slow down the degenerative process? Oh, the brain. Oh, so the brain games are reading there. Mm -hmm. So again, I think um, these are excellent questions. And at this stage, um, with these types of diseases, it's not known. So I'm going to just say for that answer, no, there isn't. What we look at um, with the other types of causes of dementia. So we talked about a little bit about vascular dementia. And I mentioned that uh, things to do with your cardiovascular health. So if you want to prevent, um, and we know a little bit more about this with vascular dementia, because we understand a little bit more about what uh, our high blood pressure can cause us and, and other things. So if you do activities, exercise, good eating, um, those activities to, and good sleeping, all of those pieces to take care of yourself, um, that might reduce the, the risk reduction for getting something like vascular dementia. But there is no, um, at this stage, nothing that, to prevent it from what we, from what we know. There's, there are lots of studies going on, um, but there's no um, strong evidence at this time that suggests that. And if that, if that seems to be, because there's a couple of questions about that, um, I would be happy to maybe add to the resources. I didn't, I didn't actually add any information about the current research that's happening or any of these pieces about risk reduction. I'm glad to see that so many people are, are asking these questions, which is wonderful. I will be, I'd be happy to maybe adjust that resource document, Jen. I don't know if you've sent it out yet. I haven't I mean, sent it out yet, so we have okay. some time. <laughs> so um, maybe I'll, I'll add a couple of um, pieces of resources for that specifically um, so that you can um, dig a little deeper into those topics. For sure. And then I just had an anonymous question come through and it says, who is best to care for a person with dementia? Oh, that's an interesting question. Who is best to care for a person? So is that referring to like whether a family member is better versus a, or, or a type of healthcare provider? Or maybe I, I wouldn't, uh, can that person maybe um, provide if a little bit could, more context? Yeah, for sure. So <laughs> if they could message me again with a little more context and then in the meantime, oh. Well, in, in the meantime, I'll, oh. We got you already. So healthcare or family is the context. Oh, okay. Great, great question. Um, I, I think that's that's a really, I've never had that question before. So really interesting one to ask. Um, I think there's a lot of things to, to weigh there though and, and consider. So um, for, I'll just, I'll start with, so basically I don't have an answer for that. That's no, no clear answer, but I think the the best situation for caring for somebody is somebody that that does know the person well. So not not to say that it should always be the family member because there's there's other things to be considering in a caregiving role, is their their ability to provide care there and. And if somebody is living with dementia at home, I'm just using that example, and that caregiver doesn't have any other supports, that can actually lead to burnout very quickly. And they might not be able to take care of that individual as well as they'd want to because they need to be balancing their own health needs and things like that. So I would, I would be more inclined to say a team approach is really the best. So a healthcare worker that can support with all of the care needs, for example, um, and, and other, you know, food supports that thing like that I would I would say that would be an approach but I don't really have a clear answer for that it's a great question though um, I might have to think about that a little bit more but thank you for for asking it and if you'd like to that person who asked that question if you'd like to chat a little bit more about that um, feel free to contact me and maybe we can discuss that situation a little bit more if you want to unpack that a bit and then another question is our diagnosis improving our diagnoses improving. Yes. 
So we didn't get a chance to talk too much about the diagnosis process. And I, I would say in general, uh, yeah, I think we're getting more access to, um, I, I think looking at access to specialists and having sort of um, different ways of, of doing the diagnosis process. I'll give you an example. I'm aware of um, some mint memory clinics out in, in Ontario where there's a group, a team of specialists that are working together. You got a family physician who's meeting with somebody, can kind of um, perhaps meet with that individual early on to see what kind of needs they have. And then they have the resources in the community to refer them to specialists and have team discussions to support that person. So I would say uh, that diagnoses, we, we are learning more about the different types of um, the symptoms, the risk factors, things like that. So as we learn more, the diagnoses can improve with that. But I think it, it does it, it does really, um, what impacts that diagnosis is the community types of supports that exist, the access to those, um, the, the different types of scans that you can do, all, the, all those things really impact that. So that's another great question that I guess depends on the area you're living and the access to, to supports you have.